Madam Deputy Speaker, with permission, I want to make a statement on the situation in Lebanon. On the 27th of July, Hezbollah launched a series of rockets into northern Israel and the occupied Golan Heights. Tragically, in Majdal Shones, one strike killed at least 12 civilians. Young people, one just 10 years old, who were playing football. I expend my deepest sympathies to their families and to the Jewish community as they grieve for their loved ones. The government is unequivocal in condemning this horrific attack and calling on Hezbollah to seize their rocket strikes. This atrocity is a consequence of indiscriminate firing, paying no heed at all to civilian life. This attack is part of an intensifying pattern of fighting around the Israeli-Lebanese border. For months now, we have been teetering on the brink. The risk of further escalation and regional destabilisation is now more acute than ever. At the end of my first week in office, I spoke to Lebanese Prime Minister McCarthy, and yesterday I called him again to express my concern at this latest incident. I have also visited Israel and discussed the situation with Prime Minister Netanyahu and Foreign Minister Katz, and I will visit Lebanon as soon as the security circumstances allow. We support Israel's right to defend itself in line with international humanitarian law. And as I said before, they are in a tough neighbourhood, threatened by those who want to see their annihilation. Over 40, including 24 civilians, have now been killed by Hezbollah strikes in northern Israel and the Golan Heights. And tens and thousands of Israelis have been displaced from the area, while in Lebanon, over 100 civilians have died and almost 100,000 are displaced. A, a widening of this conflict is in nobody's interest. Indeed, the consequences could be catastrophic. That is why we continue to press for a diplomatic solution based on UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which called for a long-term solution based on the disarmament of all armed groups in Lebanon. No foreign forces in Lebanon without its government's consent, and no armed forces other than the UN and Lebanese government troops deployed south of the Latani River near the border with Israel. It is why, even in the face of serious provocation, our council is restrained. We welcome the Lebanese government's statement condemning violence against civilians and urging the cessation of all violence. We continue to support the Lebanese armed forces. The UK has provided more training and equipment to four of its land border regiments, and we're working intensively with the United Nations and our partners, including the United States and France, to encourage de escalation. Madam Deputy Speaker, with our partners, we will do all we can to prevent the outbreak of full scale conflict, but the risk is rising. I therefore want to underline the government's advice to British nationals. We advise against all travel to the north of Israel and the north of the Golan Heights, and against all travel to Lebanon. There are frequent artillery exchanges and airstrikes. Tensions are high, and the situation could deteriorate rapidly. My right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, chaired a COBRA meeting this morning, and I am working with Foreign Office consular teams to make sure we are prepared for all scenarios. But if this conflict escalates, the government cannot guarantee we will be able to evacuate uh, everyone immediately. People may be forced to shelter in place, and history teaches us that in a crisis like this one, it is far safer to leave while commercial flights are still running, rather than running the risk of becoming trapped in a war zone. My message then to British nationals in Lebanon is therefore quite simple. Leave. Madam Deputy Speaker, the tensions on the Israeli-Lebanese border are one aspect of a wider crisis in the Middle East. Across the region, we see evidence of malign Iranian activity. In their support for Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthis and other groups whose actions destabilise the region and who show scant regard for the death and destruction this causes. 
This government is committed to working alongside our partners to counter Iranian threats. Meanwhile, in Gaza, fighting continues. The scenes at the Khadija school, civilians killed, shocking images of injured children underline the desperate conditions endured by civilians, and the reports of the humanitarian situation remain sobering, with the threat of disease and famine looming ever larger. This government continues to do all it can to provide relief to Palestinian civilians. I recently announced new funding for field hospitals run by UK Med, who have treated more than 60,000 Gazans since the conflict began. And we've restored funding for UNRWA, providing 21 million in new funds to the agency able to deliver aid at the scale needed. But what is urgently needed, Madam Deputy Speaker, is an immediate ceasefire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the hostages <coughs> must be freed. The fighting must end, and much, much more aid must get into Gaza. A ceasefire would not only alleviate the suffering in Gaza and secure the hostages' release, it would also reduce tensions across the region, helping to prevent an escalatory cycle in Lebanon and offer hope of renewed peace processes between Israel and Palestinians. As I said in the House in my first appearance as Foreign Secretary before this dispatch box, we are committed to playing a full diplomatic role in efforts to secure a just and lasting peace. Our overarching goal is clear, a viable sovereign Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel. Madam Deputy Speaker, we do not want to see more civilians killed, more innocent lives cut short, but the risks are clear. We are urging de-escalation of the current crisis while ensuring we are prepared if diplomatic efforts do not succeed with a clear call today for all British nationals in Lebanon to leave immediately. I commend the statement to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Sharon, Foreign Secretary, Andrew Mitchell. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank the Foreign Secretary for advanced sight of his statement. This is indeed a matter of profound concern and gravity for us all. The tragic and senseless attack in the Golan Heights over the weekend must be met with full unequivocal condemnation. Children and young people innocently playing football with bright futures and the rich tapestry of life ahead of them had their lives cruelly snatched away. My thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of the whole House, will be with their parents, siblings, friends and all those affected by this monstrous act. Madam Deputy Speaker, the risk of further escalation across the blue line is real and the government is right to take it seriously. We do not want to see a widening of this painful conflict and the opening of a new front would be in nobody's interest. If we are to avoid it, all involved need to show restraint. We should be crystal clear that includes Hezbollah. Let nobody forget this is a prescribed terrorist organisation which has no regard for human life, human dignity or human rights, and nobody should be in any doubt about Hezbollah's intention towards the world's only Jewish state. And Hezbollah supports Hamas, another prescribed terrorist organisation, which has also inflicted appalling suffering, with the worst atrocity committed against Jewish people since the Holocaust and the Second World War. Hezbollah must cease its attacks right now. That message must be aimed at Tehran too, the government must use the communication channels that we have with Iran to be extremely firm with the regime. Iran must use its influence to rein in its proxies and stop destabilising the Middle East. But beyond stern words, we must use all the tools at our disposal to disrupt malign behaviour by Iran and its proxies like Hezbollah, including tough sanctions to crack down on finance sources and flows of weapons. Sanctions must also demonstrate that terror group leaders cannot escape the consequences of their action. The government must also rally the international community to collectively reaffirm its commitment to implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, because that is critical for a long-term peace. If I may, I'd like to press the Foreign Secretary on three specific points. First, what steps is he taking to amplify the advice that he has already and rightly given so clearly, 
that British nationals in Lebanon should leave now? What is he doing in country to get the message across and make information on how to leave quickly and easily accessible? What steps is he taking to look after the interests of the Foreign Office and other dependents in Lebanon? Secondly, does he have an estimate of how many Brits are actually in Lebanon? And thirdly, what discussions has he had with key partners in the region who, like us, wish to see a destabilising escalation averted? Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to conclude by making a broader point. We are clearly at a critical point in this conflict. We could see Hamas accept the deal on the table, which would see a pause in the fighting, a return of the hostages, a flood of aid, and the space created to bring about the conditions for a sustainable peace. Or we could see the suffering in Gaza grind on and a dangerous escalation along the Blue Line. This is the time to be putting maximum pressure on Hamas, as we have been discussing today, and on Hezbollah. It is also the time to remain in close dialogue with Israel and maintain our position as a trusted partner, because that is critical, whether for getting more aid into Gaza or for urging restraint by Israel. The Foreign Secretary will have heard concerns in recent days about what many of us perceive as a shift in the government's approach to our close ally Israel, including in relation to the International Criminal Court. The Foreign Secretary gave me an answer on that point in, earlier, in, uh, in oral questions uh, earlier today. We should make clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, that while recognition of Palestine is important and does not need to be at the end of the process, it equally cannot be at the start of the process where it could be seen as a reward for violence and for terror. I do hope that going forward the Government will not only continue to work to avoid an escalation along the Blue Line but also maintain this close relationship with Israel. The trust and friendship that exists between the UK and Israel matters because it allows us candidly to discuss all aspects of the current conflict with Israeli counterparts at the very highest levels, in addition to using our influence as a member of the United Nations Security Council. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Foreign Secretary. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for the tone and the cross-party nature in which he made his remarks. Um, he knows better than many in this House how serious it is dealing with any crisis that might escalate um, uh, uh, at this time. He's absolutely right to draw the relationship between Hezbollah Hamas, the Houthis, with Iran. Um, of course, we keep our sanctioned regime uh, under review, but he is right to press the case about the axis, and he's absolutely right that, of course, we keep all channels open, those that we have, with Iran. Um, he'll be pleased to know that I spoke to Prime Minister Mizrani. We talked about the blue line. He will recall that I was in Lebanon um, a few months before the election was called, and I indicated um, in oral questions earlier, it is my hope to get to the region once more, um, uh, taking all advice that he would expect me um, to take. I want to reassure him that it has been important, of course, to communicate our advice to leave Lebanon, and if you are in the UK um, at this time, not to travel to Lebanon and to convey that advice across all channels. Uh, and that is taking place, it's been taking place since last night, and it will be taking place over the coming days to communicate that very loudly in country as well. He will also note that we have begun the registration scheme that allows UK nationals to register their presence in Lebanon so that we know uh, where they are, Madam Deputy Speaker. Of course, we keep the safety of our consular staff uh, in close uh, and, and uh, close review, uh, particularly with the dangers that exist with missiles being fired in this way um, on both sides. Our estimation is that about 16,000 uh, UK nationals are in the region, but of course, asking people to register does enable us to know uh, who is there, and of course. 
We urge people to leave on the many flights that are available currently, commercial flights from Lebanon, to leave and make their way to Europe and back home. And of course, we are working with our international partners. He will note that the US, Germany and Canada all um, upping their travel advice along the lines that we first began yesterday. Derek Twigg. Madam Secretary, can I um, welcome the statement by the Foreign Secretary? In terms of Iran, can I ask the Foreign Secretary, and because he referred to it in his statement about counter countering Iranian threats, in his short time in office, has he made any assessment yet about how successful they have been? Well, can I say to my right honourable friend that we are clear eyed that Iran continues to destabilise the Middle East? through its military, financial and political support for its proxies and partners, um, including Iranian-aligned militia groups in Iraq and Syria, Hezbollah and Lemon and the Houthis in Yemen. And we continue to work with international partners to encourage de-escalation uh, and a long-term peace and security in the Middle East. Lib Dem, Sp Lib Dem spokesperson Richard Fraud. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Foreign Secretary's statement and his advice to British nationals, which seems like a very wise precaution and could potentially uh, involve us not having to evacuate British citizens in the future. I join him in condemning the Hezbollah strike in the Golan Heights, which killed 12 Druze children, and our thoughts go out to their families. But now we find the region on the precipice that many of us have feared since the 7th of October last year. The escalation of the dire conflict to another front, with Israel's Minister Smotrich warning of an all-out war with Hezbollah. The UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process has urged maximum restraint and the immediate cessation of rocket fire across the Blue Line. We welcome that call and urge the UK Government to work closely with regional powers to do whatever we can to de-escalate the situation. So my question to the Foreign Secretary is has he and have his colleagues engaged with the UN Special Coordinator? And if not, will they do so, given the Special Coordinator's vital role in moments such as these? The Liberal Democrats welcome his call for an immediate bilateral ceasefire to end the humanitarian devastation in Gaza, to get the hostages home and to open the door to a two-state solution. This is a deeply insecure region and that insecurity is felt by everybody who lives there, by Israelis, by Palestinians, by everybody. A two-state solution will deliver the dignity and security that they need, and I'm reassured to hear the Foreign Secretary will, will be making those uh, calls on regional powers when he next visits the region. Foreign Secretary. Well, I'm very grateful to the uh, Lib Dem spokesman for the um, tone and manner of his remarks. Can I reassure him that I have been in touch with the UN Special um, Envoy, Amos Hochstein. Uh, I've spoken to him several times over the past. I intend to speak to him again over the coming days. And as I indicated, it is my hope to get to the region if the security situation um, allows. And he's absolutely right. An immediate ceasefire is what we need. We need those hostages out and we need the aid in. But on that point of an immediate ceasefire, if we get that ceasefire, if the Biden plan is adopted, then it allows us to see de-escalation across the region. That is why we need to see that plan adopted by both sides as soon as possible. David Pincher, distinguished. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And may I take this opportunity to welcome you to the chair. I welcome the Foreign Secretary's statement um, on... Uh, 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 on his Bala's horrific attack and his condemnation of the awful strike in Majd al Shams. What steps will the Foreign Secretary take to put maximum pressure on his, his Bala to cease its rocket attacks for good? Foreign Secretary. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. We've got a long standing no contact policy with his Bala. Um, however, we of course continue to speak to the government in Lebanon. Um, as fragile uh, as that government is. We condemn Hezbollah's destabilising activity 
and we do obviously coordinate very closely with regional partners, some of whom are in contact with Hezbollah. Sir John Hayes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, welcoming the, uh, 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 the right honourable gentleman to his place. He's not technically speaking a right honourable friend, but he's a personal friend of mine since my original attempt to stop him being elected in Tottenham many years ago. Um, uh, thank him for his statement today, Madam Deputy Speaker. He knows well there are many moderate and measured voices in Lebanon and in the Lebanese diaspora too, and I'm glad that he's emphasised the close relationship between uh, our government and our armed forces and the Lebanese army. Uh, will he agree uh, to meet a small group of people who have been associated with the all-party group, of which I have chaired? As you know, Madam Deputy Speaker, all-party groups are reforming as we speak. But there is a group of uh, parliamentarians that have been part of that all-party group. Be very useful for us to meet him to discuss what more can be done across the House to support the efforts he's described today. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, over my 24 years in this place, the strangest of friendships are struck up across party lines. And so, of course, I will meet with the honourable gentleman um, uh, and the group because this is a very serious issue, and I know that this is a cross-party issue that all members of this House will want to see de-escalated. Clyde Betts. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I welcome my right and friend's statement, and we must deplore the loss of civilian life, particularly children, on either side of the divide. So I welcome his calls for de-escalation in Lebanon and for repeated calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. But looking ahead to the long-term peace, to a two-state solution, how does my right and friend deal with the comments of the Israeli Prime Minister the other day, who said that Samaria and Judea are an integral part of Israel and they're not occupying the West Bank? In that situation, hasn't the government got to get on with recognising a Palestinian state, rather than waiting for the Israelis to come round to the view it's acceptable to them? Well, I'm very grateful to my very good friend, who has been championing these issues now for many, many years. And of course, this last period has been of huge concern to him and to his constituents. Um, I was horrified by the degree of expansion that I saw in the West Bank a few weeks ago, more in the last year than we've seen in 20 years. The violence is unacceptable. And the tone and the rhetoric and the statements from some members of the government, I think, is very alarming indeed. And so, as he would express, I did press these issues with both the Israeli Prime Minister and the Israeli uh, President. Um, and we keep the situation in the West Bank under close review. Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Secretary of State for prior sight of his statement, and I share his deep concern as to where the region currently finds itself. He will not need reminding that in the immediate aftermath of the Hamas atrocity on October the 7th, the international community allowed Israel to blur those vitally important lines between legitimate self-defence and a lust for revenge. As a result, Israel has acted with impunity and 40,000 civilians are dead and Gaza has been reduced to rubble. So what discussions has he had with Israel and their international partners to ensure that, heaven forbid, should this conflict escalate further, that all those involved know and understand and accept that revenge and legitimate self-defence are not the same thing under international law, so we avoid in nine months' time having another 40,000 civilian casualties? Secretary. Well, can I say to the honourable gentleman, it was very important for me to visit the occupied territories um, and Israel um, within the first week in office. Um, and the, we said this in opposition and we say this again uh, in government. Um, of course, given the hostages that are still in Israel. Israel has a right to defend itself, but it is a qualified right. It has always been within international humanitarian law. And the scale of civilian loss of life, the children, the women who have lost their lives, 
the aid workers who have lost their lives, against a backdrop in which journalists are not allowed into the country, has been a matter of deep concern and worry across the international community. So, of course, I raise these issues. It was also important to meet with hostage families and to be absolutely clear, we want to see those hostages returned. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and congratulations on your new appointment. I'm sure my right honourable friend will agree with me that the escalation of violence can be reduced if we look at uh, the ending the suffering in Gaza. At a briefing I attended today with Oxfam and Medical Aid Palestine, they talked about how Israel were using water as a weapon of war. People have 4.7 litres of water per day to wash, clean and cook, you know, and that is less than a toilet flush. So I welcome the position that we've taken. We've moved, you know, greatly. But does my honourable friend agree with me that we need to go much further and much faster? Secretary. Well, my honourable friend is right. The issue of water, waterborne disease, we now have polio setting in, and of course we've had the famine because the lack of desalination is a very, very serious issue. That's why it was important. Uh, to take the decision in the first days of office to restore um, aid to UNRWA, also to increase the amount of funds available to UK MED and to do more to open up field medical sites across Gaza. We will continue to press the aid issue in Gaza. I think it is important that the Rafa crossing is opened also, which would alleviate a lot of suffering. Mike Tapp. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Foreign Secretary for your calls for de escalation and a ceasefire, which of course should include the release of all hostages uh, to ensure that we get more humanitarian aid in uh, and a two state solution. But of course, we need to also look at the flow of arms, training, and finances from the Iranian, and Iranian regime to the terror proxies of Hezbollah, Hamas and the Houthis who are working uh, tirelessly to ensure there isn't peace uh, in the region. Uh, Foreign Secretary, do you agree that we should be helping Israel as much as we can to defend itself from these groups and their attacks? Foreign Secretary. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is right. When he look at the scale of rocket fire and missiles and the damage that they are doing, when you think about these poor people away from their homes, in northern Israel and boarded up now in hotels for months and months and months. It is important to have in clear view who is supporting these proxies and the arms and the weaponry that is driving a lot of conflict um, in the region, including by Hamas, by the way. And so for all of those reasons, we do keep sanctions under review. Jeremy Carvey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement today. And obviously, yet more deaths is a tragedy. Every mother and every father grieves for lost children, as do, as do all relatives. But there is uh, an issue here that uh, unless the government and Israel and others accept the ICJ opinions and judgments about the illegal nature of the occupation of the West Bank in Gaza, and, of course, the illegal nature of the occupation of the Golan Heights, then we're in danger of the conflict getting much worse. The UN Secretary General has called for restraint. Will the British government join him in doing that, but also join him in trying to convene some sort of regional peace initiative in order to prevent this whole thing escalating completely out of control? And finally, does the government reject the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights? Foreign Secretary. Well, um, I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman who I know has taken up these issues over many years um, in this parliament. Um, let me be clear that what I saw and what I continue to see in the occupied territories is unacceptable. Um, uh, he will know that the community who experienced this violence in the Golan Heights are Jewels in background, uh, and this is occupation uh, of the Golan uh, uh, Heights as well. I do recognise that. Uh, I want to see de-escalation 
across the board. Um, I want to see a solution along the lines of Oslo and 1967. That is what we all want to get to, a two-state solution. Um, and we will achieve that if we have an immediate ceasefire um, and we get back to political dialogue and conversation. James Asser. Oh, I'm going down for a question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim Shannon. Mum, I always have a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I, I'm not. Uh, uh, Humour is not what this is about, and I apologise for that. I shouldn't have said that. Um, can, can I just say that um, I can thank the Secretary of State very much for his calm and measured uh, statement. It, it encapsulates why I believe the, the temperament and the concern of all of this chamber from both sides, and I, I thank him for that. The attack at the football pitch. And Majad uh, Shams is deadly and full of complete evil. Twelve children and young adults were slaughtered. Can the City of State outline what steps have been taken to find the perpetrators, make them accountable, and ensure that the message is sent that these attacks will not bring peace but instead, instead bring further division? And what steps will be taken to assist Israel, whose very existence by Hezbollah is under threat? Uh, uh, the Hezbollah, of course, the terrorist murderers of innocents that they are and that they must be neutralised. Thank you. Foreign Secretary. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman and um, he knows a lot about the issue of terrorism and it's for that reason that he's used his position on the backbenches always to raise these issues. And he's absolutely right. There will be many people in our Jewish diaspora in this country looking with real fear, real fear, about the prospect of escalation worrying about their loved ones. We have updated the travel advice uh, in relation to Israel and particularly northern Israel as well at this time. And of course, we continue to work with our close ally uh, in partnership in what is a very, very challenging moment. And finally, Mike Martin. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, in, it, Illegal Israeli settlements are imperiling the future viability of a Palestinian state, so they undermine the two-state solution. Would the Secretary of State consider issuing a statement that says that if Israel continues to expand illegal settlements, then the UK will immediately recognise the Palestinian state? Foreign Secretary. I recognise the huge concern that there is in this House and across the world with the nature both of the expansion and the violence. I've also said that recognition is important as a pathway to peace and no country has a veto on when and how we do that working with partners. Um, I don't think, however, that the proximity of the two is the white way to go about things diplomatically. And I suspect we would struggle to find other partners that would support us if we did that. I'll now allow some time for the benches to clear before we start our next business. Point of order. 